Welcome to Haven. Please stand up and open your hymn, page 411. 411. 411장 부르시면서 주일 예배 시작하겠습니다. 411장. We're gonna sing verse 1, 2, and 4. 1장 2절, 1절, 2절, 4절 부르시겠습니다. Verse 1, 2, and 4. Just a moment, just a moment, just a moment. Are we really that pitiful? <laughs> verse. Verse 2. Yeah. Verse, verse 2, right? Verse 2. See, I, I've noticed this problem, and I tested it just now. If I stop singing, everybody stops. <clears throat> Don't stop. I might have a booger in my nose or, or a, a cough or something. Don't stop, okay? Let's try it again. Verse 2. Yeah. 2절하고 4절입니다. Verse 2. Yeah. I have a message for a love. Hallelujah. Oh, message of my friend for you. It's a message from above. Hallelujah. Jesus said it. Thank you for letting us be here. I'll just pray that you'll just uh, be with the rest of the day. Pray that it'll go well be with pastors. He brings a message here in a little bit. I'll just pray that our hearts will be ready to receive the word. I'll just pray that you will just uh, be with us, dear Lord. Just be able to pay attention and to take it in and to receive it and to apply it. I'll just pray that you will just uh, uh, be with us. Pray if someone's not saved, pray that they'll be saved. And just help us to walk away better Christians. Thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And open your burgundy book, page 20, yeah. 20장 부르시겠습니다. You're gonna sing all three verses. <laughs> Close is our revelation, for it is time. 
Good morning. How is everyone? Good morning, sir. So if you look around, you'll notice that almost all of our military guys are gone. We've only got two. We got Brother Caleb and Brother Will. And that's because they no longer belong to Kunsan Air Base. Uh, the rest of the guys all belong to Kunsan Air Base. And uh, so they're kicking off their exercises. I guess they just had a recall. So um, you won't see them until next weekend. All right. But uh, this is Brother Will and Brother Caleb's last Sunday with us. So they'll be hanging their hat. You can see over there that the plaque is down. So we'll be hanging their hats uh, today and uh, just kind of having a, a special time with them for their hat hanging. And then uh, upstairs after, I guess after the hat hanging is or over, I'm not sure exactly how all of this is gonna flow together. We're just gonna do it like, you know, one step at a time, right? But then they're going to have a bridal shower upstairs uh, for, um, for who's getting married? Ayung. My niece, Ayung's getting married. And um, I'm, not, I'm not going to go because I don't want her to get married, so I'm not going to go. And I know that'll stop everything, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So she's getting married. Um, did everybody get the uh, invitation? Everybody knows when? Yeah. Okay, so... I'm not sure how we're all going to get out there. I'm going to go by myself because I'm going to cry on the way home. So I don't want anybody to see me looking like a little baby. That's going to be happening. Anyway, today is uh, October the 31st. What is October the 31st? Reformation Day. Yes. Woo! If anybody says if anybody says Halloween, we're going to have a church meeting and vote you out right now. Okay. Uh, November the 10th is the Lord's Supper and then November the 11th. What are we doing November the 11th? Zip lining. Oh, zing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you're not working on November the 11th, I'm going to take the guys and we're going to go zip lining. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. I love it. Anyway, so that's what is coming up in the immediate future. Don't forget the uh, 21st is our Haven quarterly meeting. If you're a member, you're supposed to be there. We can't vote on stuff without members there to say yea verily or nay verily, all right? This is not a gem run church. God is the head, Christ is the head, and we are all equal members in the body. We don't all have the same purpose. Some people are hands, some people are feet. I get to be the big mouth, uh, but we all have a purpose, so we all need to be there. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's what we're going to do on the 21st. So that's all I'm going to say about the announcements. There's a whole list there. Please don't come up to me and say, oh, I didn't know. Mm. I mean, look at them. They go all the way out to January the 8th. You can't say you didn't know, okay? If you read the bulletin at all, you can see that. So uh, that's what's coming up. So with that, um, we, we had a visitor earlier, but it's a military lady. Her name was Ashley, and she wasn't able to stay because she got recalled. Um, so... We don't have her to introduce, and I'm looking around. I don't see any other first-time people, right? So let's work on that. Let's get some visitors in here. Every week, drag somebody to church. I don't care if it's the same person or a different person. Just drag somebody and get them here, okay? Get them into church. So that's, what we, that's how we have to rebuild after this whole COVID thing. Basically, just knocked us in half. I don't know. If you were here pre-COVID, you know it knocked us in half. Well, we got to rebuild. We can get discouraged, we can complain, we can do whatever we want, but if we want to see change, we got to get involved. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're going to do. And so please bring someone to church. So, any birthdays? You have a birthday? No? You, gave, you stopped having birthdays? Me too, when I was 25. No more. All right. No birthdays. Anniversaries. I just can't believe there's no birthdays and anniversaries for the, like the third week straight. Something's going on. I'm going to start looking at my calendar. All right. In that case, it's time for the Missionary of the Week, Haven Alumni of the Week. Brother Kenny, come on up and tell us all about it. Oh, I should take this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, the uh, Missionary of the Week is Pastor Bruce Roscoe. And uh, he currently serves the Lord at Lighthouse Baptist Church up uh, near Camp Humphreys with his wife, Sister Sue. And uh, in his most uh, recent prayer letter, uh, or missionary report, uh, Pastor Roscoe and the other believers at uh, Lighthouse Baptist Church 
I have asked that we uh, pray for them as they try to serve the Lord while trying to navigate level four lockdown. It has hindered their progress and made things very difficult. So it's, it's bad enough that they already avoid them for being uh, true Bible-believing Christians, but this has made it much harder. And so please uh, pray for them as they're trying to do their best. And uh, please continue to also pray for Sister Sue, as uh, she's had health problems previously, but now she's dealing with knee pains and seasonal allergies and that sort of thing. Um, also, please pray for spiritual growth for our recently saved sister in Christ. Um, her name is Mar Marlena, Marlena Allender. And so please also pray, f uh, please pray for her uh, growth, but also please pray for her family's salvation as well. And uh, lastly, please pray for uh, the Smith family. Uh, they're a family of mom, dad, and five children. And they were faithful members of Lighthouse Baptist Church. However, they have been transferred to Oklahoma. And so uh, they still wish to serve the Lord faithfully, even with all the new, all the distractions from their new assignment and such. So please pray for them. And the alumnus of the week is Pastor Dennis Blankenship, and he currently serves the Lord at Bible Fellowship Baptist Church in Sacramento, California, with his wife, Sister uh, Karen. Um, and uh, I forgot to add that to the app, so I must now go to my email to tell you. But uh, first, he'd like to uh, thank you all for uh, your prayer support. And he has asked that we pray for laborers uh, in the ministry, as they have lost some faithful folks uh, recently, which has left a huge hole in their church. Uh, he also said he needs help with uh, music, youth, and other ministries. So he uh, desperately needs uh, laborers in the field. Also, please pray for Pastor Blankenship's health. Uh, he has a bad back, and uh, he had a surgery that was scheduled, but uh, he didn't have the peace of God about it, so he has postponed that. And lastly, uh, yeah, so just uh, pray for his health and also for his wife's sister, Karen, as she does so much around the church and the home, as well as uh, taking care of her mother in their home who has poor health as well. Uh, that will be updated in the prayer app, uh, so please just pray for them throughout the week. Thank you. Does everybody have the Echo prayer app? Yes? Are we using it? It's not just taking up data space on our phones. Amen? Important. Thank you, Kenny. And open your black book 618, 618장, 검정 상품과 부르시겠습니다. First one and verse three. First and last verse, first time in Korean, second time in English. 618장 
Stand up again and open your black book 369, 369장 부르시겠습니다. 1절 3절 verse 1 and verse 3. 369.
Scripture reading this morning. We are in Job chapter four, Job chapter four, verses twelve through fifteen. Job chapter four, verses twelve through fifteen. I'll give you a moment to find that. I'd like us to all read that together. Um, one of my YouTube. YouTube followers, is that the right way to say that, I guess? One of our YouTube followers uh, sent me a message last week, and uh, they said, uh, I listened to this message, and they said, uh, I was really blessed that your church reads in mass, and he said, uh, we do something similar to that, and he gave his reasons, which were the same reasons as my reasons. And in case you don't know, there are um, two main reasons why uh, we read in Mass, why we stand and read in Mass. We stand out of respect for God's Word. We read it all together because that helps us to focus upon the passage that we're going to be looking at. That way everybody is actually paying attention to the Scriptures as we're reading. And I just thought it was very interesting. You know, there's not a lot of churches that do that. Um, in fact, I think in all of my time as a Christian, I think I've only been in two or three that actually do that. And so, if you have your Bibles, please do that. Job chapter 4, we'll start in verse 12. We'll read down through the end of verse 15. And uh, after that, I'll pray and then we'll be seated. Starting in verse 12. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof, in thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on man, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. Father, as we begin to look at this passage and other passages as well, and begin to think about the the commands and the guidance that you've given us in your word to help us as believers. I pray you'd help me to make this message clear, that you'll speak to our hearts, that every Christian here will be challenged by the preaching of the word of God, that it'll go forth in power and we will respond with our, with our submission to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. amen. And you may be seated. Before I get into the message, I want to just kind of talk very briefly about something that uh, I see. It happens every year, and it bothers me tremendously. And I know it doesn't bother a lot of Christians. It probably should bother 
every Christian. Well, not probably. I know it should bother every Christian. Uh, and I've heard lots of different things said about it. But uh, everyone knows that tonight is Halloween. In America, it has been a big deal for the last hundred years. Okay. Um, in Korea, it is now becoming a big deal. And I'm asking my Korean parents to please not let that into your home. Let me explain. Kids love candy. I love candy. Kids like to, to have fun. I, I understand. I really do. When I was growing up, I loved candy and I like to have fun too. So I understand that they like to do these things. But in the message, I'm going to explain to you the roots of Halloween. I'm also going to explain to you why we do certain things that we do on Halloween. When my kids were growing up, we didn't do Halloween. If Halloween came around, as it did every year, uh, we watched an old black and white movie about Abbott and Costello meeting Frankenstein. We popped popcorn, we ate the popcorn, we laughed and enjoyed our time together as a family, and I taught them every year why it was a wicked holiday. Every year, from the time that they were born until the time they left home, they were guaranteed on October 31st to hear about how wicked Halloween is. I wanted to ingrain it in them so deeply that when they grew up and they got married and they had my grandchildren, which I love dearly, that they wouldn't be celebrating the devil's holiday with my grandkids. It was that important to me. You must be extremely careful with your children. We develop a taste for things. And once we get a taste for it, we want more. That's one of my main problems with you know, contemporary Christian styles of music because it sounds so much like worldly music that it's only just one short step over to listening to really bad stuff that they should never hear. But that's not only true in music, is it? It's also true in the things that we wear. It's also true in the entertainment that we partake of. It's true in everything. You cannot be too careful with the souls of your children. If you want to do something foolish, you will answer to God for it, for yourself. And God will deal with you in His way between you and Him. But you need to make sure as a parent that you're doing everything you can to protect them. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world is not getting better. It's getting worse. And what we are facing as believers in the world today, I never thought in my mind that we would ever face. I never, ever thought that we would have a pandemic that would reduce our numbers worldwide by 50%. Look around you. It has an effect. When we came out of the pandemic... And everyone was allowed to start coming back to church and that sort of thing. I prayed that everybody would come back and they didn't. Why? Well, they got a taste of what it was like to not have that responsibility. What it was like not to, you know, have that burden, if you will, of having to lose their Sunday on their weekend or whatever it was. And they didn't come back. And you know these people. So do I. I contact them every week. I try to encourage them to come to God's house. I hope you do too. But the reality is, there was a little bit of a purging effect there. And what you're seeing now are ones who are a bit more serious about their walk with the Lord. So I'm begging you, if you take your spiritual life seriously, don't think of October 31st as a time to dress up your little girl like some worldly princess or some witch. Or dress your little boy up like some demon or some devil or some other wicked thing. And I've seen all kinds of stuff. And don't give them a taste for it by making them cowboys or soldiers. You draw some clear lines of distinction. 
We are to be different in everything, in every part of our being, in every part of our lifestyle, in every part of our entertainment, in every part of our education. We are God's people and we need to act like God's people. If we cannot do that, we are no better off than the Catholics or the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses that have a form without force. That go through the, the duties of doing certain things, but they have absolutely no real devotion to God. Let's not be like that. Now to the message. Every now and then, I like to refresh our church members' memories as to why we do not celebrate Halloween. I think the last time I preached this, I don't know if I preached it last year or not. I didn't keep record. It's been at least two years, I think. You might be surprised of how many believers either don't know the roots of Halloween or don't care. In either case, it's a real problem. But I think that we as Christians, we should care. We should think about where things come from. I remember years ago, I wanted, in, in my heart, my heart was sincere. I thought I was doing the right thing. And I wanted to put a Korean flag on the pulpit right next to the American flag. You know, American flag, Korean flag, thought it was a great idea. However, I didn't know the history and I didn't know the symbolism. But a Korean Christian that I respect and admire very much got very upset with me about it. Said, you can't do that. That flag has all kinds of Buddhist and Confucius symbolism on it. That doesn't belong in God's house. I said, okay. Point taken. We can do that with the things in our life, with our culture. Now, Christians... If you think that I'm insulting the Korean flag, I am not. When I see it, it doesn't mean to me what it may, may you know, say to you because I didn't grow up with that sort of thing. So it's completely different to me. But you need to understand that for that believer, that was serious. Serious. We need to take it all serious. We need to take our holidays just as serious as we take every other day. This one is no exception. Over 500 years ago, on March the 31st, a man named Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to a castle door. So, as a result of that, Martin Luther's name has become famous. That very act has become famous. And it shares the same date as Halloween, October the 31st. In the mind of a lot of people, that single act of Martin Luther, now understand, Martin Luther did not kick off the Reformation by himself. But that single act of what he did, did more to move the Reformation forward than just about anything else in history. Now there were some great, great men back then that did a lot of things. And we like to sometimes throw rocks at those great men. I'm a Baptist. I wasn't born a Baptist but I came up out of the water a Baptist and I began to study a little bit about Baptist history and I found out some things and you will too. You're going to find out if you decide to study a little bit that Martin Luther did not love us. He didn't even like us a little bit. In fact, he thought that we were vile and that we ought to be removed from the face of the earth. He didn't like us. You have to understand the culture of the day and all that he was he was coming out of and everything that was going on around him. This man was a Catholic priest. He had learned his whole life that salvation came by works. And one day he was reading the Bible and found out that his church was wrong. And that the Bible was true. And it challenged him. And he changed in many, many ways. Perfect by no means. But before you leave here going, I can't believe that the pastor actually lifted up Martin Luther. I am not. I am lifting up the God of Martin Luther. He's my brother and someday I'm pretty sure I'm going to see him in heaven. And I'm going to walk up to him and shake his hand and say, hi, I'm Baptist Jim. 
And he's going to laugh because it won't matter anymore. Do you understand the point? This man, in his culture, in his setting, in his church, saw some things wrong and decided, at the risk of losing everything, that he was going to do what was right. And we can't do it with Halloween. Halloween. We're afraid to look at our little kids and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to dress you up like a little witch today. I'm not going to let you go out and take candy from the neighbors today. Are you so afraid of being persecuted by your children? This man could have gone to the stake and been burned for what he did. It was by the grace of God that he was able to do so much more, including the song that we sang. He did that. He wrote it. If I were to walk up to the average person on the street and I would ask them, what is October 31st? The average person on the street would say, Halloween. I went to the base Friday night to drop off the guys that came to verse memorization. If you're not coming and you're a man, you are out of the will of God. You need to be there. I will say no more. Well, I'll probably say more, but just not right now. You need to be there. But the bottom line is this. When I took them back on base, it was an animal house. There was pandemonium, drunkards in the streets, loud shouting, people dressed up by, like God knows what. Many of them looked so ludicrous and ridiculous it wasn't funny. Some of them looked so incredibly carnal and sinful that it was tough avoiding them with the van because it was hard to drive around them because they were everywhere. And that's the way it was coming out of the gate. Friday night at the base. Why? Because they had some big Halloween things going on. And it gave everybody an excuse to act like demons. And that's what they did. And you're going to give your children a taste for that. While they're 10, it's just going door to door and asking for candy. When they're 15, they're going to be having parties with their friends. When they're 20, they're going to be at the jo on, on the job or in college doing even worse things because that's what the world does. And you gave them a taste for it, Christian. You gave them a taste for that. You allowed that to happen. The average person thinks that October 31st is all about Halloween and they never think once about Martin Luther. This is that time of year when you see ghosts. By the way, there's no such thing as a ghost. When you die... Your soul goes to heaven or it goes to hell and you don't hang out down here and bother people. Ghosts are interesting to me because they're a part of our culture and our upbringing. In America, ghosts, ghosts look like normal people except maybe, you know, they're, they're dead and maybe you see some blood from where they got killed by a knife or something and, you know, that's our ghosts. In Korea, you know, they're beautiful women with white hanboks and long black hair and a little ketchup on their mouth. And I see that and I'm looking at that and I'm going, wow, that's a beautiful woman with a beautiful white hanbok and long, beautiful black hair and, and a little bit of ketchup on her mouth. She did, oh, did the white makeup a little bit, but, you know, we washed that face off, she'd probably be all right. You know what I mean? Doesn't scare me at all. Not even this much. If I was walking down the street in the dark by myself and I saw somebody looking like that and she came walking up to me, I'd say, oh, you need a tissue to wipe that ketchup off your mouth? It wouldn't scare me. Why? It's not my culture. But Koreans would be like, ah! and they're out of there, right? Why? Because you learned it. That's why you learned that that's scary and that's bad and you better run. That's culture. It's not Bible. If I saw some guy get up out of the ground, go walking down the street, man, I'd pee my pants getting out of there. Because that's my culture. And I've been conditioned to fear what does not exist just like Koreans have. It doesn't exist. You die, you go to heaven, you go to hell, you don't hang out here. If you see something like that, it is not a ghost. It's a devil. You mark it down. And you have been fooled. Some of you might wonder why there is such a thing as a ghost. It's culture. It's all culture. The world says ghosts are disembodied spirits of dead people. 
gone by. It's been that way and everybody's got their own culture and everybody's got their own fear. I remind you that God did not want us to have fear except for a fear of Him. The Bible says when we die, we go to heaven or we go to hell. We don't stick around here so I don't believe in ghosts and I don't believe in dressing up my little kids like ghosts or devils. Certainly not devils. I didn't even dress them up like little comic book characters. My kids never ran around on Halloween looking like Captain America or anybody else. They could do that on January the 22nd if they wanted. It had been fine. They could do it on July the 23rd, my birthday. I didn't even accept that. That'd be all right. But not on Halloween. Let there be no association between what the world does and what we do. None. Zero. Do not give your children a taste for that. Because it will not stop with Captain America. I guarantee you. I think in our passage in Job chapter 4, what Eliphaz saw, he was speaking of, in our text, he calls it a spirit. I believe it was a demon, a devil. Just as God is real, so is the devil. How many of y'all believe God is real? You believe God is real? Put your hand up. Put him up high. Don't be afraid of it. Yeah, you believe God is real. Where'd you learn about him? In the Bible. The same book that tells me about God also tells me about Satan. If you believe in God, you have to believe in the devil. If you believe in angels, you've got to believe in demons. That's where they came from, by the way. They just got fired. Kicked out of heaven. It's the same thing. You've got to believe that. It is real. And I think that's what Eliphaz saw. The Bible speaks often of devils, by the way. Over 105 verses mention devils in the Bible. That's quite a lot. That's not three or four. That's not even 15. That's 105. Jesus faced demons a lot. Paul mentioned having a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. Another occasion, he had a problem with a little demon-possessed girl following him around, saying something true. This little demon-possessed girl was walking around going, these are men of God. But the source was wrong. The source was wrong. And Paul had to deal with that. So don't think it's not real. It is real. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to tell you that there's a reality out there you need to be aware of. Demonic spirits are there. And they're good at what they do. They're good at giving false messages to unsuspecting people. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Two things they're doing here. They're giving heed to seducing spirits. Spirits, evil spirits have seduced them. And then they began to follow the doctrines of devils. Let me explain to you what a doctrine of the devil is. It's easy for you to understand if I say that if somebody teaches you that, that Jesus was just a man, that Jesus was not God in the flesh, you would say that's definitely a doctrine of the devil. But let me give you a good definition for the doctrines of devils. Any doctrine that lowers God in any way or robs him of his glory in any way and puts the emphasis on man or, or Satan or anything else is a doctrine of the devil. Remember what the devil wants. He wants to steal God's thunder. And if he can do that, that's the doctrine of the devil. This Halloween garbage that we see every year is the doctrines of devils. Because it's robbing God of his rightful place. Christian, if you plan on having Halloween with your children tonight... How do you expect to, 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 you're going to look at your little child who's dressed up like a demon or a witch or whatever and then try to tell them about Jesus? Yeah, good luck with that. Because those two things don't go together too well. 
It's like the time I took a bunch of teenage boys. I decided that I was going to take them out. We were going to watch uh, wrestling down at the local coliseum. We were going to watch professional wrestlers. And then we were going to go home to my house and have a Bible study. The Bible study never happened. Do you know why? I couldn't get my, my, my boys to stop wrestling. What happened? I gave a taste for something. And I couldn't control it after that. And you won't be able to control it either, Christian parent. Or you might think you're controlling it this year. And you might come to me and sometime next week and say, Pastor, we did Halloween at my house and there was literally no effect to our faith. Uh-huh. Talk to me when your kid's 24 or 25 and they're going to wild Halloween parties and getting drunk and walking down the streets. Tell me, tell me that when your little girls are walking around with half their clothes off because it's Halloween party time and they're acting like the world or worse. Don't talk to me next week. Don't talk to me about the short term. Talk to me about the long term. I think the devil loves to offer a package deal to people. Something that, that looks fun. Something that looks exciting. But it's actually all about something a whole lot more evil. Much worse. And I think that Halloween is just that kind of a package deal. Here it is, the devil says. Here's Halloween. Let's have fun. Let's eat candy. Let's go door to door. Let's say trick or treat. Let's dress up. Let's have fun. And behind it all, there's something far more evil actually happening. <clears throat> the message that I'm going to give you today is in three parts. First, the roots of Halloween. I want you to pay careful attention to that. The roots of Halloween. And then secondly, its relationship to the Reformation. There is a relationship, and I want to show you that. And then thirdly, the reason to avoid Halloween. And I want to show you all three of those uh, through the scriptures. Now I know a lot of believers use Halloween as a time to pass out tracts to people. That's not bad. They're going to knock at your door. You can't avoid that. They're going to keep knocking until you open. So you really can't avoid that. But when you open, give them a gospel tract. I'm all about that. Use this opportunity to witness. Go for it. That's great. But I really think that we believers need to avoid participation in Halloween festivities otherwise. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12. I want to read this verse. I want you to think about this verse for a moment. And then I want to get into the roots of Halloween. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. Take heed to thyself, that thou be not snared by following them, speaking of the world, after that they may be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. So the warning of God to his people is, don't be like them. Don't do what they do. When they're doing things that are wicked, if it's accepted by them as a part of their society and their culture, you have a biblical way of thinking. So don't believe in ghosts, even though it's a part of your culture, because they're not real. The Bible says they're not real. And by the way, Christian, even the best Christian in this room can fall prey to superstition. The apostles did. Remember, they're out there on the sea and they're out there on the boat and they're rowing and the waves are rough and they're trying to get to shore and everything's going on. And then Jesus comes walking out on the water and what did they say? He said, and the King James it says, it is a spirit. If you look in the Greek, it uses the word phantasmos, which literally means our concept of a ghost. So what do they do? They knew people died and went to heaven and hell. Jesus taught them pretty well. They understood what was going on. But in the moment of time, when they looked out and saw something that should never have existed, they freaked out and they shouted, It's a ghost! 
So don't think you're above that. It can happen to you too. We have to make a conscious decision to be different than the world in which we live. We're not to be of the world. Here's a quote from the Satanic Bible written by a man named Anton LaVey who is dead and in hell now. He's the founder of the Church of Satan in America. Listen to this quote. This is what is written in the Satanic Bible and this is what it says. After one's own birthday, the two major Satanic holidays, so there's three, your birthday and two more. He's about to tell us those. The two major Satanic holidays are Walpurgisnacht, which is on May the 1st, and Halloween. It's in the Satanic Bible. I mean, the guy who started the Satanic Church in Southern California on a dark desert highway. Anybody catch that? No kidding. That's what the song's about. That guy, who, by the way, happens to be in the balcony on the back of the album of the Eagles' greatest hits. Look it up. You'll see that what I'm telling you is true. That guy wrote the Bible that Satanists use. And he says that the third most important holiday to the Satanists is Halloween. For us Christians, we go, okay, we got Christmas and we've got Easter and we got Thanksgiving and okay, which one is first? Is it Christmas or is it Easter? I don't know. You know, how does that work? I don't know. And we, but we know what they are. If you know how important your religious holidays as a Christian are to you, Halloween is that way to the Satanist. That's what their Bible says. Americans. Couldn't find anything on Koreans. I'm, I'm sure that it's increasing yearly. But Americans spend $8.4 billion every year on Halloween. While missionaries write home to the churches and they say, we're trying to build a building and we lack funds. $8.4 billion on devils and ghosts and candy and trick and treat and all of that. While missionaries are traveling all around America, practically begging for support so they can go to the mission field. Does that make sense to anybody? $8.4 billion. And believe me, a lot of that is Christian's money. $8.4 billion. And then the pastor has to stand in the pulpit and say, folks, we need to increase our tithe a little bit. We're not doing so well and the church is financially struggling. Does that make sense? We ain't got our priorities right. Where does it come from? Where's Halloween come from? Well, if you do any research on your own, I hope you will. Don't take my word for it. Do some research. It came from the Celtic Druid cult worship. Celtic Druid cult worship of the false god called Samhain. He's also called the Lord of the Dead. He's called by many things through history and various cultures. I know him as the devil. That's where it came from. And the date, the date, October 31st, where does the date of the worship itself come from? We don't know because it's so ancient, we can't find the beginning. You can trace it back, and the further back you go, you keep going back. October 31st has been that important to them all of this time. Among all the religious days of the Druids, the most significant day was the one in remembrance of an event called Samhain. And I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but it's not my cult. I didn't start it. It was a celebration of the end of autumn or the beginning of darkness of winter and new year. It kind of sounds like the fall harvest festival, doesn't it? It occurred on November the 1st. But the festivities kicked off on the evening before on October 31st. And that's when everybody would celebrate the Lord of Death. On that night, they would have an ancient festival. To honor their God, the Lord of the dead. The Celts believed that the, the spiritual world and the physical world 
uh, on that night, they were closest together. And so it was very easy for the spirits of the dead on that night, they could leave the spiritual realm and enter into the physical realm and wander the earth. The Romans did us one favor. Well, they've actually done quite a few favors for us. But one thing they did is when they conquered the, the Celts, the Roman historians began to write about that religion. And they wrote a lot of things for us. And we can read it and know what they did. You ever wonder why we go to door to door and say trick or treat? Because, you know, kids are not satisfied with just dressing up. They want to go out and get some candy. But why? Why do we go? In America, we go to the door and we knock. <laughs> trick or treat. Why? Why do we do that? Well, it kind of goes back, it does go back to the Celtic Druids. They believed that since the dead people were returning from the spiritual realm into the physical realm, that these dead people would go about visiting others that they knew. So you would set out these lavish meals for the spirits. Putting food out for their dead ancestors. Hello, is anybody paying attention? Does that sound a little bit like Chesa to anybody besides me? Oh yeah, that's what they were doing. Christian, you can't do that. You say, I, I gotta do that. It's my culture, my family. I get it. I understand. But it's not biblical. In fact, it's devilish. So that's what they would do. They would literally do human sacrifices on that night. Offering them on bonfires. Which, by the way, the word bonfire, it's, it's, a, it's a compound word. It comes from bone and fire. Bone fire. Because they would burn people to ashes on these bone fires. Why did they do that? To ward off the evil spirits as they supposedly visited their earthly families and their friends. Human sacrifices. Bonfires. Halloween night's kind of known for that, isn't it? A lot of places in America, they have big bonfires. They go to small town USA, and they're going to have a big bonfire in the middle of somebody's field, and everybody in town is going to go out there and celebrate Halloween at this big bonfire. People greatly feared those spirits. And though they thought, they, thought the, they thought that the spirits would harm them or even kill them if the sacrifices they give didn't please them. Trick or treat. Remember, Samain was the Lord of the dead. And so their gifts had to make him happy or else evil things were going to happen in their home. So spirits who were not suitably treated would do bad things to them. So we have our little kids pretending to be demonic spirits, though they don't know that, and up until now, maybe you didn't either. Knocking on doors and saying, trick or treat, give me what I want, or I'm going to do something to your house. That's where it came from. It came from the Celtic Druid worship. How about jack-o'-lanterns? You see jack-o'-lanterns all over right, right, right now, right? We went yesterday, we went to Changju, and we went to uh, the um, Outback. We went to the Outback. Did you notice the jack-o'-lanterns at the Outback? Yeah. Yeah? See, they had these little black sticking things in some of our food, and it had jack-o'-lantern on top. Where does that come from? Well, I know where it comes from. My mama said down and carved out a pumpkin and put a face on it. That's where it came No. The Druids would carve frightening faces into these large turnips. And then they place a candle inside it to keep the hideously evil spirits away from their homes. In time, that kind of turned into pumpkins instead of turnips. I guess it was easier to carve. I don't know. But that's where it comes from. And that whole dressing up like little witches and devils and ghosts and monsters, well, the Celtic Druids, they started that one too. They would dress up their selves or their kids to disguise them as, as these evil spirits so that the evil spirits would not know that they were people and then they would leave them alone. That's where it came from and that's why we do it. You may not know that's why you do it, 
but that's why you do it. Christianity spread throughout Europe. And when it did, many of the Celts were converted. They got saved. Catholic priests tried to replace their Celtic pagan holidays with Christian holidays. Now, there were several steps in the process, but the most significant is when the Catholic Church created a holiday, and they called it All Saints Day, and that happened in 610 A.D., and they said, we're going to have All Saints Day, and that was done in order to, to honor martyred saints. So they called it All Saints Day. Then it became tradition to go door to door on All Saints Day, requesting these small cakes in exchange for prayers, because the Catholics believe you can pray your dead loved ones out of purgatory. So I go to door to door and they say, give us some cakes and we'll pray for your loved one who died, you know, last year or whenever. In the ninth century, All Saints Day was moved from May to November 1st because they wanted to replace Samhain, which was still very much active. Part of the festivity would include a big pageant where people would dress up like one of their favorite departed saints. That's what churches do today, not ours, but churches do that. They'll have a harvest festival on August, on October 31st, and they'll have their kids come dressed up like some Bible character. Church I was in many years ago decided to try that one year. I was against it, but I wasn't the pastor. So they tried that. And you know what happened? I kid you not, Every teenage girl came dressed up as Jezebel. Why? No, well, she's the wickedest woman in the Bible, I guess. So let's pick her, and they came dressed up like Jezebel. The pastor said, I'll never make that mistake again. I said, Pastor, I, I agree with you. That's, you know, uh, it's not a good way to go. So they would do that, dress up like their favorite saints. An alternate name for All Saints Day was All Hallows Day. Now that was on November 1st. So the night before was called All Hallows Eve. In time, it became condensed into one word and shortened and it became Halloween. That's where it comes from. So the origin of almost all modern Halloween tradition comes from ancient pagan rituals, superstitions, and various Catholic false teachings thrown in. The bonfires, which come from a combination of bone and fire, goes back to the Druid fires, where they had human sacrifices. The colors, orange and black, goes back to the flames of the fire that lit up the night sky. The costumes goes back to dressing up in order to fool the evil spirits. The jack-o'-lanterns goes back to the turnips being carved in an attempt to ward off evil spirits. And the old saying, trick-or-treat, goes back to the pagan belief that spirits would require a treat to be, to be received by the Lord of Death. It all goes back to paganism. And a very bad form at that. The Puritans. How many of you like the Puritan books? You like to read those? I love the Puritan books. One of my favorite authors, his name is Thomas Watson. Mm. I love to read his stuff. That guy had more Bible in him. I hope I get that much Bible in me someday. That dude knew some Bible. The Puritans, when they came to America and the others that came to America with them, they refused to allow Halloween to even be observed in the colonies. They called it a satanic holiday and they said, we will not allow it. That was in the founding of our nation. No Halloween. In fact, Halloween never really got celebrated in America until 1900. And it just took off from there. Now let me give you the relationship of Halloween to the Reformation. I already shared with you that it was the same date and Martin Luther sparked the Reformation. But nowadays, believers are ignorant about Martin Luther. They don't know anything about him. Um, most people probably don't even know what he looked like. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure what he looked like, but I got drawings. They show him with a weird haircut. I don't really want to do that, so I'm never going to become a Lutheran. But at any rate, 
um, we know nothing about him. We know him as a religious leader, maybe who got a denomination named after him. That's where the Lutherans come from, comes from Martin Luther. We know that he wrote, A mighty fortress is our God. Remember that song? He wrote it. We know that. But that's it. We don't know much more. But on October the 31st in 1517, Martin Luther, on all Hallows Eve, when the streets are filled with people going house to house and knocking on doors and asking for cakes, Martin Luther chose that night to nail his 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg, Germany. He was a professor of theology. He knew it was going to spark debate. He was concerned about all the things that he saw that was wrong in Catholicism. He condemned the selling of indulgences. He condemned purgatory. He condemned salvation by works. And as it turns out, his actions of, of putting that on the door of that castle on Halloween, that was like posting something on Facebook that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't like. When he did that, it went viral. They translated it in all these other languages and that thing swept through Europe. And that's why he's credited for sparking the Reformation. Just a few weeks. Translated and distributed all over Germany. The Reformation was just that. It was an attempt to reform the Catholic Church. It didn't go well. Luther wasn't appreciated. The Catholics, the higher-ups, didn't like him so much. So they never really got reformed. They just pretty much kicked him out instead and marched on. But Martin Luther specifically did that on October the 31st on All Hallows' Eve. And I believe he purposefully chose that day because it was All Hallows' Eve. Because there would be a lot of people out there in the streets when religious folk were particularly focused on the dead. When people would be in the streets going house to house, asking for bread cakes in exchange for prayers for those that they believed were in purgatory. And he condemned it. So Luther was confronting some very big religious observances. The exaltation of the dead saints and the exploitation of people's fear of judgment and purgatory. And don't forget that the streets would have a lot more people wandering around. And so as we say nowadays, it went viral. And everybody knew about it. Now let me wrap up with giving you some reasons to avoid Halloween. I think I've probably given you a lot already. But just in case I missed something, we've come to that question. Should a believer have anything to do with Halloween? Well, the quick and short answer is no. No. But there are numerous reasons why. So think about it. First of all, it's blatantly and shamefully open about its dark and satanic nature. I mean, come on. That's the night when little boys put in false vampire teeth and go around trying to bite their sisters. Somebody please tell me how that's pleasing to God. It's not. And you did it, parent, because you bought them the false teeth. So why is there such a need to convince us that it's an abomination to God? I don't know. Churches in their fall festival replacing Halloween, which is basically Halloween with Christian varnish. Purportedly dedicated to the Lord of the harvest. No, it's not okay. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 11 and 12. And have no fellowship... Uh, you know what, I want to read that again, except I want you to help me read that, okay? Let's try that again, Ephesians chapter 5, let's start in verse 11, let's read that together, here we go. And have no fellowship, I don't think I have everybody reading, so I'll just pause for a moment, everybody get there. I want you to really get this principle, let's start again, Ephesians 5 verse 11. And have no fellowship, stop right there, what were the last two words that you said? No fellowship. How much fellowship? No fellowship. A little bit of fellowship? 
no fellowship. It's pretty clear in the scriptures. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. I don't know how you could see Halloween as being anything else but an unfruitful work of darkness. And the Bible says have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In other words, open your mouth and tell your children and tell your family and tell your friends why you don't do Halloween and why you believe it's wrong. Tell them. Because I guarantee you the world is telling them why they need to buy the devil's false, false gift of goods. At least let them know. Reprove them. Verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. While I was studying for this, I read lots of horrid, dark, wicked, twisted, perverted things that the cult, the Celtic cult, the Druid cults were doing. Some of it was so bad I didn't want to read it, but in, in, you know, in order to get the information to present to you, of the history of Halloween, I kind of had to wade through the mud, if you will. And I got to tell you, it's dark, it's evil, it's ugly. Believers have nothing to do with it. Halloween is filled with the unfruitful works of darkness. In fact, it's a celebration of darkness. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, Satan worshipers and occultists love Halloween. You say, well, they shouldn't love it. It's not their day. And you can say whatever you want. The reality is it's true. They love that day. Remember what Anton LaVey wrote in his Satanic Bible, two major Satanic holidays, uh, Walt Purgis Nacht and Halloween. The Bible specifically commands us to avoid it. And even the appearance of it. Even the appearance of it. No false fest No fall festival. Don't even look like it. So parents, if you're teaching your children how to do this, you're dressing them up like devils and you're and dressing them up like witches, how are you going to turn right around and teach them what 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says? Because 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. How are you going to put those two theologies together in your child's mind? You're not. If there's one thing I know about children, they see hypocrisy a whole lot faster than adults because we've figured out how to justify our sin. Kids are still learning that. So they tend to pick up on that stuff a lot faster. Turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Parent, Halloween is a great night in which to teach your children how to not be a part of the world. It's a great night to teach your children how to separate from worldliness. And though they may be laughed at by their friends in school because they didn't get to dress up like a, like a comic book hero or whatever, that will not destroy them. They'll grow up and they'll go out into the workforce where they'll get fired from their jobs if they, if they don't do what the boss tells them to do. And they won't know how to handle real life. And you started it by teaching them to compromise while they were kids. By teaching them to fit in. To be a part of society and to do what society did. You ought to be teaching them how to be different. How they can stand as people of God in a world that's going to hate them and reject them. James chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Teach them to be different from the world, no matter the cost. Right now, the cost is small. When they get older, there's going to be bigger decisions and you can help them get into the habit of making the right decisions now. There's lots of verses in the Old Testament which condemn occultism and, you know, at the same time commands us to avoid them completely. Lots of them in the Old Testament. 
I'm not going to read all of these. I'll just give you the references. But you could go to Exodus chapter 22, verse 18. Suffer not a witch to live. Leviticus 19, verse 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, human sacrifice, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. God says, I want you to have absolutely nothing to do with witchcraft. What do you want to be this year, honey? Oh, you want to be the good witch from Wizard of Oz? Okay, I'll go out and buy you a costume. And you can go door to door dressed up by the very thing that God says is an abomination. What are we doing? Have we lost our minds? And we do it. Verse 11, or a charmer, Dr. Strange, hello? Yeah, you Marvel fans, Dr. Strange? No, okay? Or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, Harry Potter, hello? Anybody out there? I'm not getting a whole lot of amens all of a sudden. There goes my bookshelf. Yep, there it goes. Or a necromancer, another wor a word which basically means somebody who is pretty much infatuated with dead, dead people, or death in general. That's necromancy. So go ahead, dress your kids up like ghosts and send them on out there. That's what you're teaching them to be, while God says he hates it. Verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. You know what Jesus said about children? Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such are the kingdom of heaven, right? He loved kids. So you are taking a child that Jesus loves and dressing him up into something that Jesus hates. Does that make sense? Not one bit, but that's what we do. Verse 12, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Your child became an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Verse 13, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. God desired that his people abhor those practices, to purge those things from the land. They were commanded to execute those who practiced any of this on any level in order to cleanse the land, to be pure of its influences. And Halloween in its essence is representative of wickedness. A host of abominable practices condemned by God. And don't tell me that times are different now. Because they're not. An evil tree doesn't produce good fruit. Jesus said that. Those who practice Halloween are representing those same abominable practices even if they dress their children up in a cowboy's outfit instead of a vampire's cloak because they're giving their kids a taste for that and teaching them to go after it. So what do we do? Revelation 18, verse 4. Revelation 18, 4. Revelation 18, 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and you receive not of her plagues. Come out of her! Christian, when your friends invite you over to their house on Halloween, you don't have to drink. There won't be any alcohol there. 
You don't have to smoke. There's no smoking allowed in so-and-so's house. But it's going to be a Halloween party, a costume party. We would love to have you come. Don't you do it. Don't you dare do it. Don't you have anything to do with it. Because God says it's an abomination. Don't do it. Understand that God hates it. Come out of her. Christians are concerned that Halloween is a day in which occultic activity is happening and should be concerned. And more activity of the devil. I mean, that's just common sense. It's his night. Right? But another real danger is all that revelry that occurs. All the drunkenness. And a good Christian who wants to protect himself or his family would never, ever allow that to creep into their home. Never. Somebody is going to come knocking at your door tonight, at least in America. They're going to knock at your door, and you're going to open the door, and you're going to look down at some cute little princess from Disney or Moana or you know, the little mermaid or something. She's going to be the cutest little thing you ever saw in your life and you're going to want to give the parent money and buy her and keep her forever because she's so incredibly cute. And she's going to look up at you and she's going to say, Twink a tweet, mister. That's not the time to go, You're an abomination to God. Get off my yard. No. Give that cute little thing a piece of candy in a gospel track written at a kid's level. And say, hey, you know what? I love you and God loves you too. It's going to happen, so use it in that way. But don't you dare promote Halloween in your family. God is set against that. Set against that. Witches, ghosts, evil spirits. They don't terrify me. You know why they don't terrify me? I don't believe in them. I don't believe in ghosts. And I do believe in witches. And I, I know that they, there's some real demonic power out there. I get that, but I'm not scared of them because my God is bigger than their God. I remember watching a... Anybody know Geraldo Rivera? Mm -hmm. He's like a talk show guy on, on Fox News right now. He used to have a, a, like a talk show on TV. and it was He always had these wacky, wild things on there. And I, I saw this one one time. And uh, he, uh, he had uh, Anton LaVey's daughter there. And he was interviewing her and a couple other Satanists and um, he was interviewing them and, and then uh, they, were, they were telling him, oh, this is real power, this is real power. And he says, okay, if it's real power, then go ahead and lift this table. So they put their hands on the table and hocus pocus dominocus and the table kind of rocks and lifts up a little bit. And I'm not saying it was fake, it might have very well been real, it might have been the power of the devil, I don't know. But what I do know is what happened next. Just made me shout hallelujah. Because all of a sudden in the audience, some big heavy set black lady stands up and she says, Is that all your God can do? My God created the world. And all you can do is move a table. And a fight broke out. And they went to a commercial break. And when it came back later, everything was normal again. But I thought about that. The devil has no power over God. Don't fear that stuff. Put it in its proper place. Don't be shocked about it. And don't be shocked if I, if I, you know, and I'll tell you straight up that these people were sexually deviant, gruesome in every possible way. Don't be afraid of that. But certainly don't lead your kids into something that that brings forth. These people love Halloween. Satanists love it. It's their special day. The Christian ought to never love what they love. So if you want to think Halloween, October 31st is a special day, make it a special day with Martin Luther and his actions and how that sparked the Reformation. Amen. And put aside all the other stuff because all that other stuff is an abomination to God. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This wasn't really a salvation message. And looking around, I, I believe everyone in here has told me that they're saved, they know the Lord. 
But I, I still want to say this, that if, if you have never asked the Lord to save you, if you've never confessed your sins before a holy God, you've never asked him to save you, you're not saved. You might be in church, but you're not in heaven and you're not going until you get saved. You need to settle that. Mostly this morning, I've just been preaching to us folk, our Haven Church members. It would be easy for me to get up here and say, folks, as the pastor of this church, I'm telling you, don't do Halloween. But I didn't just do that. I also gave you a bunch of reasons why. So I'm asking you right now to purpose in your heart as the piano plays, To change your culture, your personal culture. Don't be like the world. Those wicked worldly things, don't let them creep into your house. If they're already there, get them out. If your kids are older and they don't understand why you're not doing the same thing that you did last year, it doesn't matter. Explain it to them. Apologize to them for being wrong. And show them what a Christian home is all about. You draw the line in your life. You live before the Lord the way you're supposed to. It would be a whole lot easier for you to teach your kids and do the same thing. Don't teach them how to fit in. Don't teach them how to compromise. Don't teach them how to get along with the world. Teach them how to stand for God. And when it gets to be tough, and it will, how to make the right decisions instead of the wrong ones. That's what we need to be teaching them. If you think the world is tough for you now, what do you think it's going to be like when they get to be our age? It's going to be worse. And if we don't do in our generation what's necessary to prepare them, they'll never stand. Let's do our jobs. plans for tonight if you're planning on celebrating Halloween I'm telling you as your pastor break those plans don't be a part of the mess father thank you so much Lord for your word you've given us all the guidance we need it's really up to us whether or not we'll obey it Lord this is not something that we didn't know I mean when I got saved, it was obvious to me that dressing up like a witch or a devil was not the right thing to do. Now, Lord, having the scriptures and understanding more about your word and also knowing more about where it all comes from, this should be an easy decision for us. And I really pray, Lord. I, I, I pray for America. It's in a mess. You know that. I pray for Korea, too, that they'll not follow the wickedness in that culture. And I pray, dear God, that we as believers can make a difference. I ask you, Lord, to help us to, as we purpose in our hearts to do the right things, help us, Lord, give us strength. It's one thing to want to do it, but then it's quite another to actually have the strength to do what we want to do. And we need your strength to do it. So I ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us. And then, Lord, at the end of the day, when we look back, we'll know that we've pleased you. Come what may... Our God smiles, and we thank you for that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, don't anybody run out. Everybody sit down. we got a couple hat hangings to do. we got to hang some hats. Because we love them so much, we might even allow them to keep their heads in it. Yes. So, yeah, we got to kind of clear up over here. Let me do something with this real quick.